And now let me go ahead and introduce our speakers here. So the first is uh, Lucas Lavin. This is Lucas. <laughs> and Lucas is a senior from Kihei Charter uh, High School. He's uh, going to be starting at UH Manoa this, uh, this fall, majoring in, he says astrophysics, I say physics. <laughs> Um, we're, we're still having that, sorting that out, but, uh, so anyway, and, and he's also an avid paddler, um, and, uh, he's going to be talking about, uh, this binary star system that he's, uh, identified and selected and decided to, stu to study, and our, uh, NASA ambassador to the, the solar system is a real aficionado of double stars and binary stars, no so... Yeah, no pressure at all. No, no pressure at all. Okay, and then we're going to hear from Jordan Vaughn. Jordan, uh, she's a rich, she came here from Texas where she was born and, and partially raised, and she came out here a couple years ago. She's now a sophomore at Maui High School, and she's going to be talking about um, using Gaia, which no, is... No, that's not me. Oh, using, <laughs> sorry. sorry. Using, uh, you were using Kepler? Yeah, it was Kepler Stripe Data... That's a technical detail you guys, I guess, don't need to hear about. But uh, using the satellite to look for Earth-like planets orbiting other stars. Wow. So maybe a new home for us. <laughs> and then uh, finally, Celeste Young and Ellen. You guys, some of you already know her. Um, Celeste it was almost born on Maui, as we said last, last year. Uh, she was born in... Um, Holland and came to Maui at about nine months old. Um, she is a senior at, at uh, and Ellen uh, High School. In other words, she's homeschooled. And uh, she's planning on uh, majoring in physics. Physics, or are you just yes. saying that to no, avoid an argument? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, all right. Well, let's, let's go ahead and uh, give uh, Lucas a round of applause. So you can get him to get out here. Okay, so my name's Lucas Lavin, and my project that I've been doing, I've, the project I've been doing, I have named How Stars Collide, But Not Quite, or, or Not Quite. Yeah. So I chose to observe a binary star system. Now, for a fun fact, you all might not know, but two-thirds of all the points in the sky are actually a binary star system. So that means two-thirds of every single star you'll see has two stars in it. <laughs> Not really one. Um, so the star system I chose was RR11. It's, it's a pretty interesting star system because the stars are actually quite close, as you can see by the fact that they have a 21-hour about 22 hour period, which essentially means how long it takes to orbit the two stars that orbit each other. <laughs> so, and because binary stars can be different brightness, they can change, depending on where they are compared to us, I have these, um, <laughs> depending on where they are to us, we can see a visible brightness change in the star. So, for example, you have a bigger star and a smaller star. <laughs> and so the bigger star, assuming both stars are on the main sequence, which is basically the majority of a star's lifespan, and 90% of all stars in the sky are on the main sequence, that would mean the bigger star is blue and it's hotter, or bluer and hotter, and the smaller one is going to be redder, and cooler, but at the same time, the bluer star is going to last longer, and the redder star, or the bluer star is going to die quicker, and the redder star is going to last longer. Now there are other changes, but that's if it's not on the main sequence. So the blue big star and this red small star, if this blue small star goes behind the big red star or the blue <laughs> big blue star, you're going to see mainly the light from the big blue star. If the, from no transit, or, yeah, no transit, you'll see light from both, 
kind of combine, but for the most part, since the blue star is bigger, you're going to be seeing mostly the light from the blue star, but you'll still get some from the red star. And then there's this point where you, the brightness of the blue star has gone down, but it doesn't really account to much depending on how big the small star is, which is, and using this method, you can determine the mass of each star. And, the ma and so the known magnitude difference, magnitude is just a fancy way of determining how bright a star is, is between 10.2 and to 11.1. The magnitude system's kind of weird. For whatever reason, whoever made it decided to do it flipped. So smaller the number, the brighter it is. For example, our sun is about negative 36 magnitude. 26? Okay, Jamie says 26. <laughs> so say that again, the, the smaller the number, the what? The smaller the magnitude, the brighter the star actually is. So what I did to observe our, our lab. Well, through JD, I was able to use Las Cumbres, which is the telescope array that spans the entire southern hemisphere. And for the most part, very grateful to him because otherwise even most professional scientists have a hard time getting at the top of that list. So I use that. Yeah. That's why if you want to start observing something, JD's your guy. <laughs> so on top of this, I also use two databases. I use the AAVSO, or the American Association for Variable Star Observations um, VSX database. Uh, it, they, it's just a collection of variable stars, which binary stars are also because of the fact that they change in brightness. And there's other types of stars that are variable, but we're not focusing on those. I also use the SIMBAD database, which I basically just used to help me find my star when using, when looking at the photos of it. Um, I used a method called relative photometry to find out the brightness of my star. So I didn't find the actual magnitude of the star. I compared it to another star, and I'll explain why I didn't need to find the actual magnitude. The actual magnitude the reason I used relative photometry was because I'm trying to find, all I need to do is find a light curve, which is basically just measurements of magnitude or relative magnitude change over time. So I'll, I'll, I'll show you the light curve later, but it's basically just because the bigger star goes in front of the little star. The little star goes in front of the big star. That's going to cause a little dip, or a big dip. <laughs> and when the big star goes in front of the small star, it's going to cause a little dip because only a small bit of the light is being blocked. Uh, and I, for the photometry, I used Meyer DL, which is basically a three hundred dollar program. <laughs> and the only reason I was able to use this is because of JD. It made things so much easier. APT is another program. It's free, but it's also very annoying to use, especially when you're soaring through 300 so images. Um, the light curve I use to predict transits. So no transit, secondary, primary transit, <laughs> or primary, secondary, sorry. That's, you basically just use that to predict the time, and the way you do that is by taking the time, the Julian date, which is just a fancy day. After. It's basically so many days after a specified date. Don't ask me why they decided to do that. <laughs> um, and then add the period. So the period's the amount of time it takes to orbit on a predicted transit. So we had to try and take a picture at the right transit, <laughs> which was fun and add so much periods to it so we can make future predictions and get what we need. After I found, 
for made predictions, we need to catch we need to catch the spectra. And the spectra is basically just a measurement of the wavelengths of light, because light is made of waves and photons, but at the same time. Um, and the reason we need that is to determine the temperature. And my whole goal of this project was to get the temperature of both stars. And the equations I use, I'm not going to actually put them on the board, but the, to find temperature, I used Wien's law, displacement law, for any of you who actually know what that is. <laughs> I was able to predict, this is the light curve that I got. So that, that's over about 22 hours. The little dip you can see is when the little star goes in front of the, behind the big star. <laughs> and when the big star goes behind the little star is the big dip. And because of this, just because of this alone, we can tell that it's a close contact binary. And we can also tell because of how long the period is, but a close contact binary, binary star is basically a star that two stars are so close to each other that they're warped. So these Roche lines right here, they kind of merge. Like the star gets deformed and merges along these Roche lines into each other. And that alone is very interesting. If they were far enough apart in an uh, image, I could show you how they are deformed, but they're too close, so I, haven't been I wasn't able to get a picture of that for you guys. So the primary, I've been able to predict the primary and secondary transits for like through the next year. <laughs> so, and I have not been able to find the temperature of the second star, but I did find the temperature of each transit. The transit is about, the primary transit's about 7,000 degrees Kelvin, and the secondary transit's about 7,125 degrees Kelvin. And the reason, and using this, just this two data, I can find, I found the temperature of the A star or the big star. There's multiple stars. It goes A, B, so on and so forth. So the big star is 7,123 Kelvin. And the reason I know that is because the big star is in front of the little star. So that means all the light we're actually seeing is from the big star. So therefore, because we only are seeing the big star, we don't need to do any weird, funky math to try and get the the temperature like I need to do with the B star, which I have not done yet because I still need more data. Future research. I need to light, get the light curve of the blue and green spectra. The light curve I got was only of the red spectra. I didn't need that to get this far in the project, or the blue and green, but it'd be nice to have just so I can show you the difference in how each light is. I need to get the spectra of the no transit, so like this, in order to find out the temperature of the secondary, of the B star. Along with that and the primary transit, I can essentially that's just kind of a broad term for it, subtract the primary transit from the no transit and get the temperature of the secondary star. I also want to observe or reobserve QT Ursa Majoris, which is a star in the big, the Majora constellation. Ursa Majoris the big bear. Yeah. And it's a real cutie, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah. To repeat that. <laughs> it's a big it's a star in the Majoris constellation. It's a big cute bear, big bear. Big bear. It's a cute thing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, your delivery sucks. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Keep going. And the reason I want to do that, because it was the inspiration for my project. It's kind of a long story, but I originally wanted to observe that too, so I'm going to do it. And I have already started on a paper that I'm going to do and hopefully get published to the AAVSO website 
or the JAAVSO, but the J only stands for the journal, so <laughs> not much more. And I've already started working on it, and hopefully soon I can get it published. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> My name is Jordan Vaughn. As you can see, I am a 10th grader. And um, my project is called Take Me to Your Planet, <laughs> Determining the Habitability of Exoplanets. Now, I'm going to start this off with a really corny astronomy joke. <laughs> so, how do you do a astronomy get-together? Thank you. <laughs> so, as the great JD once said, <laughs> astronomy <laughs> is like the Freddie Mercury of science. Most astronomy fills our souls, but not our plates. JD Armstrong. <laughs> so, for those of you who don't know, an exoplanet is a planet outside of our solar system that orbit, orbits, not orbits, our own Earth star. Or their own Earth. You know what I mean. <laughs> and, um... We observe these by using different and various transit methods, the most common being the transit method. Now, um, from the previous thing, he did eclipsing binary stars. Uh, that's really similar to this, because the planet will go right in front of the star and block some of the luminosity that's coming from that star. And then we'll just get the transit. So that's pretty cool, I think. Um, so... You may be wondering, how did I get into astronomy? Well, way back when, I joined a program called High Star. And during this program, I was working on hot Jupiter-like planets, which means they're basically the size of Jupiter, and they're really close to the star, making them extremely hot. It's pretty justifiable by the name. And after I did that, I got really intrigued by exoplanets, and I wanted to find something more down to Earth. Um, so I decided looking for earth plants. <laughs> um, the way I did this was I searched through thousands of light curves, eventually settling upon 23 that looked to be possible planetary candidates. I probably went through hundreds. Uh, or it says 27 actually right there. Not 23. <laughs> and I got these from um, a paper from Pedigura, and they're there's not a screenshot of the paper. Okay. Um, my hypothesis was um, that one in every five planetary candidates is said to be habitable, at least for the Kepler telescope, which was meant to find Earth-like planets. So I used Kepler data because it was seemed to have more likely possibility and decided to go from there. There's the Pedicure paper. It looks like that. So the way I did this was I took the um, some FITS files from a mass K2 archive, which has all these beautiful light curves of these planets, and I inserted them into um, in Thought Canopy, which is a Python program, aka coding, and I turned them into a FITS file into a text file, and that made me able to be able to read them because you can't read them when they're not in the text file. <laughs> Um, once I did that, I inserted them into a Google Spreadsheets. And they look like this. You can see all the multiple trends. It's right there. Um, that's not really useful to me. I mean, I can see there's transits, but I don't know how long the transit is. I don't know how deep the transit is. Like, if the transit's consistent, I don't know that. So, in order to do that, I fold the light curve. You may be asking... What does folding the light curve mean? And that's where you take the period and then you do some um, a mod command in Google Spreadsheets, and that'll take all those transits and line them up perfectly. And once that's lined up perfectly, I can finally start. This is just the beginning. <laughs> um, so what I my first step was to find how deep that transit was which would give me basically the size of the planet. Um, smaller planets would have more of a smaller dip, while larger planets will have a more larger dip, 
and that's because they're blocking more light from that star. Um, so in order to find the transit depth, the planet radius, and the stellar radius, I used this. And that's the radius of the planet squared divided by the radius of the star squared. And there's some um, miscalculations that you have to go through, like dividing this by 110 to convert it into um, stellar radii. And that means that they'll be able to, yeah. <laughs> so my next thing was using Kepler's third law. We all know Kepler. Yeah, he's a cool kid. And um, this would help me find the semi-major axis or orbital distance. Now, this is the quantity of the period of the planet squared times the mass of um, their star divided by the mass of our sun divided by Earth's um, period, which is 365 squared, to the one-third power. And that will get us how far this, their star and the planet is. After that, I am able to um, find the temperature, which is what you need to have it be habitable. If you don't know the temperature, you can't really know, because um, it would be in the Goldilocks zone. And this zone is where it's just the right temperature for there to be liquid water. And that's between 200 and 300 Kelvin. Um, so by inserting all this stuff that I had gotten from my previous equations, um, I was able to find the temperature of the planet, which is um, T, the temperature of the star, to the quantity of 1 minus the albedo. Albedo is how shiny something is. So the greater the number, the more shiny it is, and then the lesser the number, the darker it is. And this helps because if you have light reflecting off of that, then that's going to make it look like it's kind of smaller or hotter, you know, vice versa. Uh, to the one-fourth power, square root the radius of the star divided by two times the distance. Yeah. So, in conclusion, Earth-like planets are a lot harder to find than Kepler makes it out to be. <laughs> a lot <Yeah>. harder. <laughs> um, it's more easy to detect large gaseous planets that are extremely close to their host star. And um, I think this is because um, Earth has a period of 365 days. And the planets that were all observed have a period of around 30 days, which means they spin a lot faster around their star, which means, therefore, they're closer. And by being closer, they're hotter. And we were looking at sun-like stars. So they're going to be like Mercury, except bigger, Jupiter. <laughs> Um, the closest planet that I got, I don't exactly remember his, um, epic ID, and, but he was around 600 Kelvin, which is 300 Kelvin above the habitable zone. And to put in perspective of how big he is, he's eight times the size of Earth. And I'm calling him Reginald. And what kind of life would be good there? What kind of life? Well, unless you're a flame monster, you can't live there. Humans are... <laughs> no. <laughs> There's no water. Um, so what I'm going to do next is I'm going to find the composition and masses of these planets, which means are they actually gaseous or are they a really big terrestrial planet? Like the daddy of Earth. He's like, whoa. Um, and I'm going to be using this by using radial velocity, which is a technique I personally haven't used yet. And I'm really looking forward. That's going to be stressful. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm also going to be trying to look through more planets, because out of all of them I went through, again, I found none. And that's kind of sad, especially because I'm a team of one. Um... <laughs> And then if I find, well, all the planets I observed have been previously undiscovered. So that's about 27 planets that I observed that nobody else has observed. Uh -huh. wow. And I'm going to try and publish my findings with the help of our JD over there. He is a great fan. Give him hunk. 
Um, so I would like to thank the people who helped me along this way because without them I couldn't have done it. Um, that is my mentor in Oahu. Sadly, he cannot be here. His um, name is Sam Grumblatt. He used to be a um, intern for NASA. That is JD. You know that face. That's JD. Um, and this is Mr. Amada. He's a teacher at Maui High. He helped me with Photoshop, gave me the resources to work after school, and things like that. Um, I would like to thank High Star, which is, I wouldn't even be here without them. They're the ones who taught me everything I know from planets to binary stars that I did last year. They've taught me so many things that I cannot, I can't, eh. <laughs> and, and who pushed you into High Star? Um, you probably don't know her, but her name is Catherine O'Connor. She's now young? What's her name now? Young. Young. She's now uh, Miss, o Miss Young. Uh, she's married now. Probably, yeah, obviously. <laughs> and um, she, when I first moved here, she said that she saw something in me, and so I joined her astronomy class, and she forced me into High Star, and it was great. And I, I thank her every day for that. <laughs> and last, but certainly not least, I would like to thank my family. This is my little sister, Michaela. She's um, seven years old. My brother, my dad, my boyfriend, and me, and then my mother, who was taking the picture, so I put a nice big picture of her. <laughs> and she will not be forgotten. And without them, I couldn't have done this. My poster board for science fair was helped with my boyfriend, because I don't know how to Photoshop. I, I get frustrated easily. And yeah, that's my family. <laughs> <laughs> Now. Oh, there we go. Okay. Mm, I can technology, I promise. Okay, so I think a lot of us know the classic nursery rhyme, Starlight, Star Bright, the first star I see tonight, but today I'm going to do a little twist because I observed some really fast stars, so I decided to call my presentation Starlight, Star Bright, the fastest stars I see tonight. As JD mentioned, my name is Lus Jongnalen, and I am a senior. Okay, so I'm talking about fast stars. Well, what are these fast stars? Um, the ones I'm talking about most today are going to be called runaway stars, which, like the name suggests, are abnormally high velocities compared to an average star. And typical formation occurs when you have a multi-star system that has a supernova explode. And so at point one, we see star A and B, and they're orbiting each other. And at point two, star B then explodes into a supernova. And so at point three, star B has lost most of its mass and can no longer hold star A into orbit. And so it is then, due to conservation of energy, ejected out of the system at higher speed. Um, the other star we'll be talking about a little bit is hypervelocity stars. These are a subclass of runaway stars. Um, so runaway stars can pretty much form anywhere in space, but hypervelocity stars have a more specific definition. They have to originate from the supermassive black hole. And so again, at point one, we have star A and B. They're orbiting each other. Point two, they continue orbiting each other. But at point three, star A is then captured by the supermassive black hole so that star A is now orbiting the supermassive black hole. And again, due to conservation of energy, that other star B is then ejected out of the galaxy. And to give you a little perspective, some of the slower ones are about 2.2 million miles per hour. Really fast. Um, and so basically, for my project, I've been working with these guys for a little while, but um, I wanted to identify my own candidate selection. And so it turns out my timing was pretty perfect because um, Gaia Space Observatory, which is sent by the European Space Agency, released their first of five total data releases in September 2016, when I just was starting this project. And probably a lot of you don't know what Gaia is, but basically they are, uh, their main mission is to create the largest, most precise um, maps of the galaxy to date. And so in order to do that, you need incredibly high precision, position and motion calculations, which is perfect for identifying these speedy guys. So. There is one limitation, though. I knew I wanted to use this database, but let me run down what you usually need to find a true velocity of a star. Usually you have the line of sight, which is the distance from Earth to your target. You have something called proper motion, which is the angular motion you detect 
when we look at the sky from Earth, so up, down, left, right type of motion. And then the third component is radial velocity, which Jordan lightly touched on, but that's basically the motion towards and away from Earth. And so you're able to calculate the true space velocity of a star by using these components. However, like I mentioned, Gaia is a first of five total data releases. And so right now, they have line of sight. I'm able to get that from something called parallax, the distance. And then I have proper motion values because they've released quite a few of those already. But radial velocity won't be set till something like 2022. And I just am not patient enough for that. <laughs> and so I asked the research question, can runaway star candidates be found in the Gaia database without use of that radial velocity. And so to test this, I, uh, well, it's not a hypothesis, but I do have one. Took it down. <laughs> but basically, um, to, to find these candidates, I first downloaded the database, huge files. Um, there's a little over 1 billion targets in this database. So I was a little intimidated. But um, basically, not all of those 1 billion have completed calculations. Um, only about 2 million or so do. And so I wrote my very first computer program. Very, very scary. And a very easy project to start learning, right, guys? <laughs> <laughs> um, but basically, I was able to use Python and filter through this 1 billion and only uh, write the targets that I had completed calculations for so that I could just focus on those 2 million or so. Um, and then the next step... Oops, was to separate this data because the galaxy has motion. You can't compare stars that are moving in this part of the sky with this type of motion with stars in this part of the sky with this type of motion. And so what I decided to do is separate the sky in five degree blocks of right ascension declination. Not important. Basically, it's like the longitude and latitude of Earth. It's just a coordinate system. Um, and so I divided the sky into these five degree blocks. And I also divided by parallax. Like I said, that's kind of a distance measurement because stars that are farther away are naturally going to appear slower than stars that are closer to Earth. And so I needed a separation so that I could focus on similar groups of stars. Um, once these blocks were created, I was then able to find stars that had faster stars compared to their friends. Um, so basically, I did this, don't get scared by the formula, please. <laughs> um, basically, the change in proper motion. So I had a target, and I had the average for that block, and that di difference was then divided by the standard deviation. And I know there's a lot of younger kids in this audience. It's basically so that you don't have any errors as a, a baseline. And so by doing that, I was able to find the motion uh, that was uh, the stars that were faster <coughs> compared to the stars in that block. And um, right ascension declination are two motions. So I then just did. Pythagoras theorem, which you young ones will learn soon. But basically, you're able to get combined motion in the sky. And I chose the criteria combined motions greater than 10 sigma were named my candidate runaway stars. So these were the stars I thought were much faster than the other stars in their neighbors. Um, and then once I selected my candidate runaway stars, I'm a student. I can't just say, oh, yeah, these, I found them, guys. That's it. <laughs> I actually had to look at known databases, and so I cross-referenced manually, which was a very painful process, but uh, the coordinates one by one. <laughs> and yes, I'm going to make a program to do that eventually because that was very painful. But um, I was then able to see any known information that was on these targets and then add them to my spreadsheet and start to analyze whether I was actually selecting something that I wanted to. Um, and so the results, we started with 1 billion targets, actually a little more, but 1 billion targets. Just over 2 million had the completed calculation, so that was the first filter. And then I named 1,107 targets with combined motions greater than 10. Um, as a quick test, you want to make sure that your candidates aren't in one block of the sky, because that would say that I did something wrong in my methodology. So I quickly did a sky, platter, this, uh, sky scatter plot. And as you can see, the coordinates are right ascension definition, so this is the sky. And immediately, JD and I went, oh my goodness, look at that. There's that U-shape. That's the Milky Way plane. And so, for fun, we got a sky map and we photoshopped it over. As you can see, the blue is the actual Milky Way plane. And you tell me, I think that's a pretty evident fit. Yeah. And then, um, for the cross-referencing results, I found 332 had the note high proper motion, which was really encouraging because not only did I say, hey, I think these stars are fast, so did this database. And so... Along with that, I found two high-velocity notes, which is even better because that's 
velocity, not just the proper motion calculation. And then two peculiar stars, which I thought was really funny, um, nine red giant branch and five horizontal branch. The other database was less successful because I, uh, the, the, data, the, the targets I look at are not the same targets that that database was really looking at, so it was very rare to actually find a match. And if they did, they came up with 91 cosmic ray child, which basically means, hey, the star was moving faster than we thought and we couldn't get accurate findings. So that was also a good indication. Um, but yeah, basically, to conclude, this method narrowed down a list of 1 billion targets to 1,107 likely candidate runaway stars, with just over 30% showing notes of like high proper motion, high velocity, strong indications that these stars are moving fast. I concluded that the hypothesis was supported that, um, well, I didn't have a hypothesis, but research question was supported. and. Uh, that the candidates selected are worthy of further research. And so that being said, I'm actually doing a lot of further research, but I don't have enough time to tell you too much about it. But basically, I'm working on methodology tests. Um, I want to do block sizes. I chose five degrees, but I'm testing three degrees, seven degrees, nine degrees, seeing what effect that has on my candidate selection. I also have been working on origin tracking. I mentioned hypervelocity stars originate from the black hole. Runaway stars can originate pretty much anywhere. And so the idea is once I have my candidate selection, I've been tracking down the origins to find whether they originate the black hole, making them further a high velocity star candidate, which is really what I want to find. So that would be exciting. And the last thing is, during my research, this is a newer discovery in astronomy, and it's very hard to find referencing information on these stars. And so my ultimate goal is to hopefully make an easily accessible website with all of my candidates, any known information I can find, and compile it so that when JD has new students, huh, any of you guys, <laughs> you'd be able to go reference to my website and have an easier time completing your research. Um, I would like to thank Dr. JD Armstrong because he is amazing. He has worked with me since I was really young, and he's been incredibly encouraging, very helpful, and he's really taught me what it takes to love researching astronomy. And so that's something I I'm forever grateful for. And I also like to thank Dr. Eden Ginsberg. I think Ginsberg. Um, he has been very helpful in specific hypervelocity star information. Like I said, this is kind of a new field, and sometimes when I'm lost, even Google can't help me, JD can't help me, then I really, really appreciate his help. Um, and then lastly, like Jordan, I'd really like to thank my family. JD mentioned I'm homeschooled, and so as you can imagine, my family is everything. They give me all the support, and I'm very, very grateful. Um, this is my family. <laughs> With that, I'm going to bring Jordan, uh, Jordan and Ruby back. And we're going to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, we're, we're just going to pass, pass it. Oh, perfect. <laughs> and you're going to hold it up close. Yeah. yeah. That was about and repeat good. the question. Mm. All right. <laughs> Uh, any questions? Yeah, any questions? So I have a question for Lucas. Were you, were you playing absolute or uh, apparent? Apparent. Okay. Repeat the question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was, I use, was I finding absolute magnitude or apparent? The, yeah, I, I was finding apparent. <laughs> I can understand when a planet or a passes in front of the sun or a star, yes. that light would be diminished. But if you have two stars, why would light be diminished oh. when you have two light sources? Uh, a star that's hotter. Uh, repeat the oh, question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, if he, if a star is passing in front of another star, why does the light diminish if they're both light sources? The reason for this is because one star is bigger, or the blue star in this case, is bigger and brighter and because there's a higher area for it to produce more light than the red star, which on the light spectrum, the red star is actually even dimmer than the red, blue star. It, the blue star, or the, <laughs> the red star is basically replacing that much area of blue light with dimmer light, so it looks like there's less light. Thanks. Oh, our, um, this lovely man in the back. Oh, uh, okay. Asked, um, 
if planets are found around binary star systems, and that's absolutely. Um, I've actually observed one back in 8th grade. I don't remember the exact name of it, but it had uh, two eclipsing binaries, and then it also had a planet. And I thought that was really cool. <laughs> Too bad it was discovered already. <laughs> Anyone else? So for Celeste, can you actually observe can you see runaway or high velocity star? No. no. Uh, the question was, can you actually see these runaway stars moving? No, unfortunately, that's more of an asteroid type of situation. They don't move fast enough, but by calculation, we're able to detect faster stars. <laughs> yeah. But it'd be cool. It'd be more fun for me. <laughs> <laughs> Celeste, mm -hmm. can you determine if any of these runaway stars are between galaxies and other galaxies? Left the I think that some. Oh, the question is, can you detect if any of these uh, stars are ejected out of the galaxy? That's kind of the question. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's pretty. We're, we're feeling pretty confident that hypervelocity stars can be ejected. I don't know if there's. Hypervelocity stars. The definition is they are like, moving fast enough. Fast enough to escape the galaxy, but I'm not sure if we've actually seen one of those. So. Yeah, but that's the definition right now. Jordan, your project last year. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> My project last year, it's been a while since I've talked about this one, so forgive me if I'm rusty. So, um, also during High Star, it was like 17 Cepheids undiscovered. I liked undiscovering things and discovering them. That's fun. <laughs> I feel important. <laughs> um... So I found a Cepheid, and we tried to calculate how far it was, because, you know, it was really bright, and it wasn't, um, it wasn't in the AABSO catalogs, or in any catalogs for that matter, so it hadn't been found. And um, looking at it, you would think, wow, this is actually outside the, 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 the halo of the Milky Way. <laughs> and... Um, JD proposed the idea that if it's outside the Milky Way and it's extremely bright, and by the location it hasn't been discovered yet, then maybe it's a hypervelocity star. Actually, it wasn't. No, it was not me that proposed that. Yes. It was you. No, it was not. You're the one who told me. JD proposed somebody no, else's proposal. Who was somebody else's proposal? Oh, it was. You were my mentor. I'm proposing. Not that you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, this is Sunny. <laughs> I'll, I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> so, but, but anyway, JD's the one who told me about the proposal. Who's the proposal? No, it was, it was your uh, mentor. What was his name? I can't think of his name. I can't think of his name. Anyway. Yeah. He was cool, I though. <laughs> I liked him. He <laughs> can't remember his name. You liked cool. him so much you forgot his name. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get back to you on it. I'll put it in the comments of the YouTube video that's going to be posted on you. You'll know it then. Just check YouTube. <laughs> and then share it with your friends. Any more questions? Yeah, I'm not sure who this huh? one Ari Hines! Hines it! Hines! Hines it! Yeah. Hines! Yeah, Ari Hines. Hines. My question might not apply to well, any of you. It never occurred to me until you talked about the binary planets having an orbit that does our sun have an orbit. I always imagine it to be stationary and the planets are, are revolving around it. Okay, the question is, is does our sun have an orbit? Um, this it has nothing to do with our projects, but I happen to know that because our solar system is actually on one of the outer layers of the Milky Way, we orbit around the center of the Milky Way. But every one billion years of the Milky Something ridiculous like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But doesn't it like also orbit in place because the planets are also pulling apart? Oh yeah, and then it also has... Another way to detect exoplanets. You know, Wait, what? What? The wobble, what? The wobble what? method. What are you talking about? <laughs> you don't remember the wobble method? That's, 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 that's not what you remember. Wait. I know what okay. that's basically <laughs> describing. <it. laughs> Focus. <laughs> that wasn't the question. No, but it answers the question. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Yes, wobble because of planets. That's I feel like that's too far back. Okay, whatever. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what is... Um, yeah, you 
kept referring to Kelvin. How does that relate to centigrade in, in Fahrenheit? I don't know. Do I answer Kelvin? You, you have to Kelvin. Ah. Degrees Kelvin, Kelvin. is 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I didn't, didn't ask you that. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's, uh, the, the question was, how does Kelvin relate to um, other temperatures and stuff? And I actually didn't know that. Thank you, Sarah. You saved me. Um, so Kelvin is equal to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. It would be, it's, we use it because it's easier. Instead of saying, like, this thing is 1 billion trillion quadruple billion <laughs> Fahrenheit degrees, you know? And so we use Kelvin. It could be like, okay, well, if 1 Kelvin is every 100 Fahrenheit, thank you again, sir, uh, <laughs> then we could just be like, oh, this thing is 500, then yeah, it would be 5 Kelvin. Kelvin. Celsius. <laughs> <laughs> you, sir, in the back, I don't know who you are. Hello. I am learning things no, every day. I would say so. I would, That's pretty smart. I would <laughs> say so. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Celeste. <laughs> um, Celeste says yes, so I'm going to say yes. <laughs> what was the question? Oh, the question! <laughs> the question was something about Kelvin, and it was like, um, if Kelvin gets cold enough, then no, something. <laughs> the question was whether Kelvin, when it's zero degrees, if that is actually when there is no movement ever. And oh, what are you doing? Put the mic closer to your phone. Oh. Anyways, the, basically, we're just elaborating on Kelvin. You know, you should go watch a Khan Academy tutorial on Kelvin. <laughs> Ask JD. <laughs> There's also a terminology for that. It's called absolute zero. Yeah. <laughs> JD. That's the right answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have another question. Uh, the binary star authority. Uh -huh. uh, if, if you've got a binary star and there's planets, do they have some kind of funky orbit? Because they're being controlled by two stars? <laughs> well, instead of like how our star just kind of like... Okay, the question was, if you have planets orbiting around a binary star system or multiple stars, Will the planets have a funky orbit? Yes. <laughs> Basically. What? Yeah. They will, yeah. Kind of. Well, you want to take this since no, you've don't. observed it? No. <laughs> <laughs> this is your question. It's about binary stars. It's also about exo. Well, you. he said binary stars first, so you get to answer. <laughs> answer is... Uh, okay, I uh, clearly don't know the correct answer. <laughs> In my honest opinion, I'd say yes and no. It depends on... Yes and no, not to be too... <laughs> <laughs> it depends on how close... So there are two cases, those that have more key orbits than those that don't. Okay, yeah. See, that, that, <laughs> that was a pretty honest answer. He, he said that the way I meant it to sound. I like the so there's the two cases. <laughs> ones that do have wonky orbits and ones that don't. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and right from Lucas's mouth. Uh, in the middle. Because you said that um, like two thirds of the stars we see are actually binary stars. So, like, if I look at Orion, so the like half the stars in the constellation of Orion are binary stars. What, Jamie? So yeah. half of the points yeah. for two thirds of the stars are in binary stars. Yeah. So okay. Question. The question is: is so if she looked up at the sky including Orion as a specific example, would half of those stars have two stars in them? Yes. <laughs> I th even Polaris, the North Star, I believe has two stars. In the back? Yeah. No, yeah, yeah. I have a question about the exoplanets. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm curious, what did you have to know about the stars Oh. In order to look at the planets, because he was talking a lot about how the stars affect each other. All right. Well, in order to know about the planets, <laughs> oh, la, 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 la. <laughs> so, he asked, um, "What do you have to know about the stars to 
know about the planets in simplest term, correct? Okay. And um, through my project, I had to know specific things about the star, which was like the radius of that star, the temperature of the star, um, the mass of that star, and then with those, I inserted those into the equation. I didn't need to know everything about the star, just those specific things. So as a follow-up to, to search for the exoplanets, you do have to know for that information about the star. Yes. The question. The question. Yes, you do. Question. The question. Question. Do you have to, uh, you have to know the information to be able to do those things? Yes. <laughs> to find exo, yes. <laughs> Any other questions? Man in back in green shirt. Um, so, have you, like, ever been any types of, like, Proxima Centauri B, which is close Proxima Centauri. Proxima, have you ever looked at Proxima Centauri? I've never looked at it personally because Question. it's just... Oh! <laughs> Why are <you> screaming <laughs> Hello, YouTube. <laughs> um, the question was, have I ever looked at uh, Proximus Centauri B, which apparently he said has the most exoplanets? No, it's Proximus the closest. Centauri is the closest star to the Earth, oh. to the Sun, and B would be the planet orbiting. Oh. Oh, no, I have not. But I have heard of it. Yes. So, so repeat that so the, the, the people out there watching through the camera can hear again. <laughs> um, so he's asking if I've ever observed um, Proximus Proximus Centauri of B. <laughs> yes, thank you. And the answer is no, but I do know of it. And the reason I haven't um, looked at it is because it's discovered. <laughs> <laughs> Is it known to be a binary system? No. Yes. <laughs> Janie? Janie! <laughs> Alpha Centauri, Theta Centauri, and Proxima Centauri are all three stars that are orbiting each other. Oh, okay. that's so cool. So repeat that for the audience. Oh, cool. <laughs> so it's a triple star. Yeah. So Alpha Centauri. Alpha Centauri. Beta Centauri. Beta Centauri. And Proxima Centauri. Proxima Centauri. Proxima Centauri. <laughs> All three of those stars orbit three, each other. Three so. stars, they orbit each other. <gasps> and they have planets. <laughs> so how close to, how close together are those two? <laughs> far apart. Far apart. But they, if you, if for you, and we're, Light we're years. pretty close. Question. <laughs> how close are they? <laughs> To each other. Close. To each other. Close, but not close, considering yes, distance. It's a relative you know. term. <laughs> close. It's, it's close, but not like close as me, like, you're a foot away. It's like, it's like a use away. They're not, yeah, be more than blue, I think. Yeah. yeah. They're oh, far away, far. but oh. close in, like, like the grand scheme of things. Of, so he, he would have some good ideas, I think, on the distances. Close. Yeah, they they're far enough apart so that the planets are orbiting them are not affected by the other stars. Oh, oh, the, 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 the stars are far enough. Planets are far enough. The stars are far enough apart for the planets to be unaffected by the other stars' gravity. Gravities, whatever. Any more questions? Wow. Okay, this may be a totally inappropriate question because I just grew up with that yellow But when you were talking, Celeste, about the runaway stars and they all start out with the, in the binary system, do once they leave that other star, they absorb the black hole. Does this runaway star ever hook up with another star? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Um, oh, the question I wasn't going to get to it. <laughs> the question was: um, these high velocity stars, runaway stars, they get ejected. Um, if they the question was basically, do you think they would ever hook up with anything or have any conflict? Basically, a lot large assumption in my project is that no, they will not, and it's it's possible, but um, unlikely. Space is a vacuum. It's <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty unlikely. <laughs> It'll be here after a while. That's not necessarily true either. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> you get back to us. Any more questions? No more questions?
Alright, thank you.